we're going to be in Matthew 25, and I'll start in verse 31. And uh, the message is uh, called Marked for Eternity. And this is like one of the very last things that's on the prophetic calendar. One of the very last things where everybody starts moving into their eternal destiny, both for glory and for condemnation. And so um, it's a big deal. And for those of you that are in Jesus, um, I, I, I want you to receive tonight encouragement and emboldenment and just relief. I don't mind telling you that. Just experience the relief of the Holy Spirit that even if you're in the best place you've ever been in life, it's going to give way to something immeasurably better. And if you're in a terrible place, hey, man, take the relief that the Bible gives that it's all temporary down here. And it's going to be amazingly overhauled. Matthew 25, 31, Jesus is speaking and he says of himself, he says, when the son of man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly, I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me, naked and you did not clothe me, sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them saying, Truly, I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And then Jesus closes and he says, and these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Now, some people call this a parable and it actually isn't. Um, Jesus does use a metaphor of sheep and goat, but he's actually describing a, a future event and it it's the future event that, that many people don't even want to look at. It's it especially unpopular in our day when we live in a generation that really just shuns the idea that a good God could judge anybody. And the frequent protest to biblical Christianity is, I won't believe in a God that would send anybody to hell. And of course, we have many answers, and that's not my point tonight. My point is not to give a rebuttal to those kind of statements. But the fact of the matter is, is that every single human being deserves to go to hell, but by his grace, some make it into heaven. So people always ask, how could a God, good God send people to hell? And the better question is, how can a holy God let anybody into heaven? And so we, we magnify the grace of God, but the reality is, and I'm not going to be light about it, is every single person who dies having rejected Jesus Christ has an eternal inheritance separated from God in a place that Jesus described as hell. And that's the Bible. It's not popular. It's true. And so part of the urgency of every generation has been to remain aware of the eternal destination of all of those who are outside of Christ, both the unrighteous and the self-righteous, both those that are immoral and those that are moral yet apart from Christ. And so we've got to realize that um, church doesn't make you a Christian any more than standing in your garage makes you a, a, a Tesla, <laughs> you know? Walking in the building doesn't do a thing for you. 
But we live in a generation where religion masquerades and people find anesthesia for their guilt in religion and church attendance. But the closer we get to the end of the age, and I say this every week, I know I'm a little bit on repeat, but the urgency of the hour is what compels me. And I refuse to dilute it or turn it off because I'm telling you, as we get down to the, cl- the closure of this age, w- passages like this rem- remind me what's on the line. And so let's, let's get into these verses. Again, pardon my voice tonight. Um, matter of fact, let me clear it. <clears throat> let's talk about what it means to be marked for eternity. But it starts off like at a highlight. And we've got really three primary players. We've got Jesus Christ, we've got the righteous, and we've got the unrighteous. Those are the three primary players in this passage. So let's start with Jesus Christ. And I I describe him as one who's going to be enthroned for exalted worship. This is after the tribulation. This is after the Antichrist has been manifested. This is after the Antichrist has been defeated. This is after all the tribulation years and Jesus Christ returns. And this is what the Bible says in verse 31. Jesus takes his rightful place. It says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. I promise you I could spend the next 45 minutes on that verse. I want you to leave it up there, please, if you don't mind, Angie. The, 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 the scene is, this is the scene that all Christians, if we can clear out the clutter in our lives, this is what we're waiting for. We're waiting for the vindication of the glory of Jesus Christ on this planet. We're waiting for the moment. Now, look at the wording. He calls himself the son of man. I love that. That's the most human and humble title that you'll find of Jesus, except for maybe the suffering servant. But the son of man is Jesus saying, "Um, I am coming to you in this moment, and I'm describing what you see now as the son of man. But the son of man is coming back, and he's going to transition. He's going to show us that the son of man, when he sits on his throne, is not going to be the son of man. He's going to be the king of kings. And so, but, but notice this, the son of man will be coming in all of his glory. All of the glory we haven't seen, all of the glory that he veiled at the incarnation. He's coming back and there will be nothing, nothing diluted, nothing hidden, nothing veiled. He will be coming back visibly. We've already talked about that. The entire planet will be able to see him. If you'll remember with me, the sun stopped shining at the end of the tribulation and Jesus comes back in all of his glory and the utter uh, blackness of the earth where there is no sun shining, no light, and he radiates the sky. But it's not just him coming back in all his glory. And, and again, we don't have time to talk about what all does that mean. But it is the act, absolute revelation of his deity and his essence and who he is, and it will be shining and radiating. And every eye is going to behold it. But notice this. He's not coming back in, in his, just in his glory. All of the angels are coming with him. Notice, notice the descriptor. All of them. All of the holy angels are leaving heaven and coming with him to earth. Now, now I'm, I'm just sitting there thinking, I don't even know how to preach that. I'm like, all of the angels, all of them? I mean, if you read the Bible, you know, just casually, you find out angels themselves are glorious beings. If you've ever been in a service where there is an angelic presence in the room, oftentimes the presence of an angel will bring everybody in the room down on their face to their knees and leave them there like unable to get up. And all of these angels are going to come back, the entire innumerable two-thirds of the original angelic host, one-third fell and became demons, two-thirds coming back with Jesus, and they've got their own glory. I mean, he's got his glory, and they've got a reflected glory, and they're coming back with him, and then he's going to sit on his glorious throne. Do you get the repetition? Glory, 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 glory. That's what's coming. That's what's coming to this planet. Right now, the the name of Jesus is mocked. It's ridiculed. It's used as a curse word. People think so lowly of this when they laugh at him. They think we're idiots for following him. They look at history and they see this Jewish carpenter that supposedly led a religious movement, prophesied, healed some people, maybe. And then they laugh because we think he rose from the dead. And then, and you know, then we're dedicating our lives to him and, and we, we follow his principles and we advance his kingdom, his invisible kingdom. And they, they just think it's a joke. Some of them laugh and others get mad. 
But in this moment, in this moment, everything's vindicated. His name, his glory, his mission, his truth, and his people. And so when I think about this moment, this is why I do what I do in life. And this is why, pardon me, I am never going to be completely at rest until this moment because my salvation's incomplete until this moment. This moment right here is what I'm living for. Do I believe it by faith? I believe it by faith. Do, 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 do I, am I longing for it? I'm longing for it. But this, this right here is going to happen. Like I'm going to see him coming back. I'm going to behold him in his glory. The Bible says when we see him, we shall be like him for we will see him as he is. So there'll be a transformation above us, a transformation within us. Let me just tell you this. It's going to be good. It's going to be unspeakably, mind-blowingly good. But more than anything, I just want to tell you, there's something in my heart that I, I don't know how it plays out, but I'm just let my sanctified ima- imagination have my moment. I want to be able to look at him in that moment. Like, if this is presumptuous, it's presumptuous. But I am hope I'm like within 10 feet of him at some point. And just looking at him in all his glory and saying, this is the moment. This is your vindication. He's been waiting for his name to be cleared for 2,000 years. You know, we get been out of shape because somebody's upset with us for six weeks. He's been waiting 2,000 years, and he's going to get his name vindicated. I just want to look at him in his glory and just say, this is why. This is the one. Well, verse 32, we're going to see that in this glorious throne, watch, before him on his throne. Notice he's going to sit on his glorious throne, an actual physical throne on planet earth, a glorious throne. What does that mean? Well, you can read a little bit about it in the book of Revelation, but the, the, it's just going to be mind-blowingly altered state, just kind of glorious. And it says before him was going to be gathered all the nations. Now, remember, this is at the end of the tribulations. There's going to be people uh, living on the planet. And all nations will be brought before the throne of the glorious one. Nobody's going to be rebelling. Nobody's going to protest. Nobody's going to be saying, I can't make it. He's coming back, not as the meek and the mild, turn the other cheek, gentle shepherd. He's coming back. And the Bible says he's going to be ruling with a scepter and a rod of iron. And every nation is going to be coming before him. I don't know how that's all going to work, but it'll work because the Bible says it. And he's going to separate the people within those nations. He's going to do it one from another as a shepherd, excuse me, as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Now, if you went back 2,000 years ago in an agrarian culture and you've got shepherds working the fields, and oftentimes the goats and the sheep, they would feed in the same places. When it was time to bring them in, the shepherd would stand near the gate, and as the, the, the two flocks, the goats and the sheep, would come, he'd hold a stick and he'd tap them which direction they go. They're all coming to him. He'd tap the sheep, he'd t- or tap the goats, he'd tap the sheep, tap the goats, tap the sheep, and they would be separated. Because they don't do the same things at night. And they had sometimes the weather is difficult for the, the goats. They can't handle the cold where the sheep can. So there was always a separation. And so that's the metaphor. That's the picture that's being used here. But Jesus isn't talking about uh, farm animals. He's talking about humans. And as you well know, the goats represent those that don't belong to him. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. The goats are unbelievers. The goats are those that said no to him. And by the way, I'll just go ahead and throw this out there. At this point, it's too late. And no salvation for them. The unbelieving will be unbelieving forever. Those that rejected Christ will have been rejected by him forever. There is no second chance. There's no last minute bailout. There's no let me explain myself. This is the final separation. It's the wheat and the tares being separated at the end of the age. It's the same moment. And so Jesus is going to separate them and all the nations of the earth that have those people that have survived the tribulation, they're now coming before King Jesus on his throne. And he will, in some way that Jesus can do, because he's the divine son of God, he will separate perfectly every single individual as believers and unbelievers. So verse number 33, he will place the sheep on his right but the goats he will place on his left. Now, I want you to remember, I'm trying to teach through this, but I'm also not wanting to teach it so intricately that we lose our grasp that this is actually an event that's going to happen. 
like actual people, actual Jesus Christ and his glorified body on this planet, separating two groups of people. And in that moment, here's, here's what I'm thinking. At that moment, both groups will be able to see the other group. So those that are the righteous, saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, will look and they will know those people are damned. And they'll know why. And the damned will look and say, those people are justified, forgiven, saved. Like these two groups are not going to be like so far apart from each other that nobody knows. Like chances are, like getting real here for a second, there's the possibility that one in each group will look over and see their spouse in the other group or their children or their parents or their pastor. And there will be the, that moment where it is divinely manifest, the separation, the fence straddlers gone, no more fences to sit on, the fake, the phony, the religious, the cultural Christian, the one who played the part, the one who knew all the songs, knew the Bible passages, knew how to pray the prayer and count the beads and do all the stuff, gone. It's all gone. And in that moment, it's the, it's the naked and trembling standing before the God with whom we have to do. It's that moment. And all of this is coming and Jesus is presiding over this, not as the meek and mild shepherd, but as the perfect judge. The king is the judge. He is the executive branch, the legislative branch, and the judicial branch, all sitting enthroned on a glorious throne. And what he does is perfect. Nobody's getting ripped off. Nobody's getting done wrong. It will be absolute perfect judgment, eternal vindication of his name, and there will be this, this understanding that every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God is true that the written word of God is true, that the true prophets, preachers, teachers, evangelists, messengers, true, everything we said, true according to the word of God. It's all, it's just in a massive vindicating moment. And guys, I don't know if that motivates you, but we live in a realm of injustice. We live presently in a realm where people are done wrong. We live in a realm of oppression. We live in a realm of deception. We live in a realm where even Christians don't know how to get along and agree on truth. And I'm looking for today, like the day where we are free from deception, free from oppression, free from things not being as they should be. And in this glorious moment, guess what is about to happen? It's not quite there yet, but this is stage one of God returning to planet Earth everything that Adam forfeited in the garden. <laughs> I mean, that's what God's been doing for, you know, for 6,000 years. God's been trying to get us back into what Adam and Eve fumbled in the garden. And very close to this scene, it will be done. So that moment of awareness is going to strike everybody, goats and sheep. It'll be a visible separation. Now, let's get, we're, we're going to go, I, I usually like to go get the bad news over with first and build towards the good. We start with the good and it gets worse as we go. So y'all buckle up, Okay. So let's talk about this second group. So you got one who's going to be enthroned in exalted worship, and then you got some that'll be marked for everlasting wonder. Uh, God help us to recapture our wonder with him. Like, I think one of the tragedies of this age is the church has lost her awe of God. We just lost, we, we misplaced our awe of God, and we're, we're, we're all factories. We're, we're built for awe. And we no longer direct our awe to God. We're in awe with stuff and events and pleasures and things like that. And that's why people are constantly chasing more and more because their little awe factory heart has to be filled all the time. And these little things down here can't satisfy us like he's meant to satisfy us. So we're constantly trying to get little stuff or more stuff or more events or more pleasures and whatever it might be. Like we're stuffing our hearts because we want to have awe of something. We want, to be, we want to be reconnected to our wonder. And so we, we're just trying to do it with stuff that can't satisfy. But in this moment, uh, here come the wonder years, so to speak. So verse 34, listen to the glorious invitation. This is to us. 
This is to the, the redeemed. Then the king. He was the son of man in verse 31. Now he's like, then the king. And Jesus is talking about himself. He's like, when this moment happens, not the son of, I'm not operating as the son of man. I'm operating as the glorified king sitting on his throne. The king will say to those on his right. Now listen, he's actually going to say this. I, I'm so tempted to paraphrase. Let me paraphrase and then I'll do it the right way. Come on, y'all. You who are blessed by my father, get in here. Inherit this kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. I don't think, he, I don't think it's going to be Shakespeare. I don't think it's going to be, come hither now. Enter into paradise. I, I, th- I mean, listen, Jesus, <laughs> you know, he's, he's the one that paid for it all. He's going to be excited. He, he, he's not just been waiting on his name to be vindicated. He's waiting to be with us for 2,000 years with nothing in between. So the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom. Inherit the kingdom. Inherit the kingdom. Prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now, I could preach this verse for the next 45 minutes, but I'm not going to. So the king says, it's all about to happen. You over, you over here on my right, come on in. You're about to get everything my father promised and prepared for you. You're not going to miss a thing. You're going to have all eternity to understand what's been prepared for you from before the foundation of the world. So it's not an afterthought. Like the bestowing of the kingdom to the saved is not something that occurred to God like, you know, 20 minutes after Jesus died on the cross. This is the plan. Now, I don't know how all that works, but the plan before time was and before we were and before the planet was, the plan was God was saying, I'm a king and I'm going to have citizens in my kingdom and my kingdom is so gloriously good. I can't keep it to myself. I'm going to create people and we're going to share it for all of eternity. And if you're in Christ, you're part of that. So come blessed by my father and inherit the kingdom. Guys, just very quickly here. I know this is prophetic passages you know, pointing towards the future. But if you'll remember that it's the Father's good pleasure to give the little flock the kingdom, you will not obsess over this kingdom. You you won't. Listen, enjoy the things of this world. Enjoy them that are lawful and yours to enjoy. Uh, I think Paul wrote to church at Thessalonica and said, God has given us all things to richly enjoy. I'm not one of those guys that's like, man, if you enjoy stuff at all, you're a terrible person. But what I'm saying is most, most people, maybe not most, but a lot of people, they're, they're living in a perpetual state of low-grade panic because they don't think they have enough. Either like um, enough amount or new enough, nice enough, pretty enough. It, it's silly. Like, we get it all. <laughs> we get it all. We get the kingdom. That's what's coming to you. And all of this stuff is Transitory. Like walk with, and I'm just going to say, I'm not a flatterer, but I, I want to say, walk with your head up, child of the king. Walk in dignity. When, when people are chasing wealth and riches and fame and notoriety and pleasure, I mean, for the life of me, I'm, I'm not really watching the news, but I will glance at the headlines about once a day. I have no idea what's going on with Johnny Depp and this woman. But all I know is that America has been obsessed at least for two weeks because every time I click on a website, it's Johnny Depp, the actor. And this, I have no idea what's going on, but all I'm thinking, <clears throat> pardon me, but who cares? Like, why do we care about that, whatever it is? And so I'm thinking to myself, we are so in awe with the horizontal. And you're made for so much better than that. And like, like here's the beautiful thing, that, we, that we're going to get the horizontal, but we're going to get the best horizontal version that ever was. Because he's going to remake the heavens and the earth, and he's going to say, this is the domain of my kingdom. Enter in. It's been prepared for you. I think, I love that. That like, literally, that he knew that he was preparing the kingdom, not just for people, but for you. Like God can do that. God can look at down the ages of all the redeemed humanity and also know your name and know that you're going to be in there. And he did it for you. And so he, he welcomes everybody in 
And then he tells them something that is a little shocking to these people. This is, again, pointing to the future. He says, enter into the kingdom, prepare for you before the foundation of the world. And look, look at what he says. He says, for, for I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty. You gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. And then verse 37, then the righteous, those that are about to walk into the everlasting kingdom, they're perplexed. They're saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? Now, I love this because these people who are declared by Jesus to be the righteous, who will spend eternity with him, they're so unaware of the good stuff they did with their lives. Now, listen, forgive me, but these are not causal statements. They're not getting into the kingdom because they did these good works. They did these good works. It's not causal. It's called evidentiary. It is the evidence of their regeneration. And what Jesus doesn't say, he doesn't say, well, you believed the gospel. You believed that I lived and died and rose again. And so you're going to enter the kingdom. He's literally showing them their lives. And it's so precious because he says, I watched how you live. And what I did inside of you flowed from inside of you to outside of you. And, and the people are like, I, Jesus, we, we never visited you. We never fed you. We, we, they're, they're stunned by the fact that he is affirming their lives on earth. By the way, did you notice what they did? He doesn't say because you preached. He doesn't say because you did all the stuff that we, no, there's nothing wrong with preaching. I'm doing it right now. But I, I love what he says. What, what he, he literally is saying is, I saw that your faith was so strong that it deeply impacted how you flowed into the lives of others, particularly those that couldn't help themselves. Now, he starts off by saying, you did it unto me. But their question is, I don't, I'm, I'm sorry, Lord, I know you're on your throne and you're divine and you're omniscient, but we don't remember that. And so he's going to answer their question. And this is a great practical teaching moment because these words from Jesus, he's, he's, he's relaying to them the evidence of their kingdom conversion while they were living. It's not the cause of their kingdom conversion. It's the evidence of their kingdom conversion. But they're saying to him, we don't remember that. And so verse 38, and when did we see you as a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Now don't miss that. I'm going to give you something here. I, I'm not going to stop using the phrase, we are to serve God. But I am going to qualify what I mean when I say that. God is not in need of your service. He's never needed anybody to serve him. He, ha he was self-existent and perfectly capable of taking care of. He didn't even have needs, so I can't even say it that way. But he was perfect, perfect in self-existence. He created the angels, but he didn't need the angels. He just wanted to display his glory in creation, so he created all the angels. And eventually he created man, but listen, he loves us, but he doesn't need us. And he certainly doesn't need our feverish, frantic, religious, panicky service to him. Why? Because before you ever got dropped into the kingdom, God was just fine without all of your stuff. But I notice what he does say. Jesus says this. You don't actually technically serve me because I don't have any needs that I can't meet myself. But I receive your service to each other as if you did it to me. So hear me on this. Because there's been a big push in the last decade, all about abiding, all about soaking, all about just resting in God and resting. And we don't want to be a Martha. We got to be a Mary. And I get all that. Listen, I've preached that stuff too. But the problem is, is the pendulum has swung so far. And the reality is, is that Jesus doesn't need our service, but people do. People need us to serve. And glory of glories, when, when you serve me and I serve you, Jesus says, thank you for serving me. And the evidence of a converted life that Jesus gives is that we, we understood, saw, and met the practical needs of those around us. He doesn't say because we had 200,000 followers on social media and because we had bank and because, you know, we went to the biggest church and had the coolest ministry and, you know, had, 
It's just none of that's there. As a matter of fact, in Matthew chapter 7, these same, this, this next group of people, so this Matthew chapter 7 is connected to Matthew chapter 25. And Matthew chapter 27, excuse me, Matthew ch- chapter 7, there's a bunch of people that are about to enter into condemnation. And you know what they're saying? They're protesting and saying, wait a minute, we prophesied in your name. Oh, 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 we, we're the ones that cast out devils in your name. And Jesus, you may not have noticed, but in your name, we did many wonderful works. And Jesus says, oh, I saw all that, but I don't know who you are. I mean, it's just incredible to me that like the stuff we think we do that's religious stuff. And when Jesus just kind of ignores that here and he's like, yeah, you visited that lady in prison. Yeah, when I didn't have proper clothing and shelter, you helped me. When that hungry person was there uh, in your community and you, you took time to feed that hungry person, like nobody followed you on Instagram because of that. But you did that to me and I noticed that. Why am I saying that? Because listen, I just want to say in this season as we approach the end of the age, quit waiting on the big spectacular way to serve God and start serving the person next to you. Start doing that because Jesus validates it and, and says, that's actually evidence that you're mine. And the, the fewer people that notice, the bigger the reward. Oh, y'all don't believe that. Jesus said about the people who were doing all their public stuff, he's like, oh, they just got their reward. <laughs> you know, the Pharisees praying the impressive prayers and the people, you know, waving their $100 bill before they, you know, backflip it into the offering plate and do the John Travolta pose, you know. I mean, it's, it's, it's so silly, you know, that, but, but ultimately Jesus is like, yeah, that's actually all the reward you're ever going to get. So if you do it for man's approval or man's applause, that's your reward. Man's approval and man's applause and nothing waits you in heaven. But for the secret person who doesn't want anybody to know, but they fed the hungry, they visited the sick, they took care of the prisoner, they sheltered people. Jesus is like uh, telling the scribe angel in heaven, write all of that down, write all that down. That's going to get a big reward. And the fewer people that know about it down here and the less applause you get down here. Um, That's why Jesus could say the last are going to be first. The people that nobody noticed down here. Listen, there's going to be some folks in heaven. We're going to be cleaning their mansion and shining their shoes. And they're going to be people. I'm I'm saying that tongue in cheek, but they're going to be they're going to be those people that were never even noticed down here. Like I have my ideas about who's going to be first in the kingdom. I'm going to tell you, it's not going to be American preachers not. It's probably going to be third world prayer warriors that were dirt poor. Nobody ever knows. I'm, I'm just ruining some of y'all's vision of the end times. You're like, no, I'm telling you it, when he words mean something. So when Jesus says the first will be last and the last will be first, he didn't say, you know, we're all going to hell. He, he's just saying this. He's saying the people you think are going to garner the rewards in heaven probably are be, going to be closer to the back of the line. So let's not live for golf claps, likes, and follows. Let's, let's, let's become like stealth. Serve undercover. Serve children on Sundays. Yep, I just got practical. Serve in the nursery. Serve in VBS. Like write big kingdom checks and don't tell anybody. And it doesn't have to go all the time. Oh, God, help me. Please help me. It doesn't all the time have to go to your church. Like, do stuff that, that, like, your church doesn't know about. Like, that's what I'm talking about. Like, get into the place where we recognize that, oh, my goodness. Just taking care of folks is important to the heart of God. I'll, I'll never finish this message. I say that every week. It's just, it's just, it's going to start being my final point in my message. You're not getting past this. I'm just going to. So, they're asking, when do, we, when do we see you do it? And Jesus says, hey, you, you did it to me. So how people, how we Christians treat those around us, that's an indicator. It's a primary evidence of whether or not we truly belong to Jesus. And by the way, I, I'm not going to skip this. He said it's how you treated the brethren. So it seems to be an emphasis on how did you treat the people within the family of God? It's not primarily an evangelistic thing. Some people think he's only talking about how we treated people during the tribulation. I think it's much larger than that. And he's saying how you regard the body of Christ, the brethren, and how you took care of those that were suffering 
for my name, suffering in the context of their Christianity. How you treated them, I regarded it as how you treat me. So guys, this is a great opportunity for every single one of us to examine our hearts with a scourging and a purging. You, you can't live embittered with people in the body of Christ. You, you really can't live embittered with anybody. But the emphasis is if, if you like, I, I don't know how often y'all do it. I, I do this like, not, maybe not daily, but several times a week, I'm checking my heart like, Lord, is there an attitude I've nursed towards somebody in the body of Christ? Am I walking around? Is it affecting my behavior and my interaction with them? And I'm like, if, the, if it is, Lord, expose it. Because I don't, I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to have an awkward moment in that group on the right of Jesus who puts us all on the right. And we're like, yes, we're in the group. And then we look over and like, oh, I can't believe she's here. You know, just get it dealt with, right? Just deal with it right now. It's like we're, Billy Humphrey used to tell me all the time, Jeff, we're all going to be best friends in heaven. Like, it's, and that actually helped me because me and I were actually mad at each other when, we, when he told me that. And he said, hey, bro, we're all going to be best friends in heaven. I'm like, come here and hug me, man. Come on. Yeah, it's just true. It's just not worth it. So let me let me go on. I'm going to let me stick to the text here. But um, so let's let's. Let me, let me give you this one verse real quick. I'll throw a proverb in here. Proverbs 20, 11. Listen to this. This is in your Bible. Even a child makes himself known by his acts, by whether his conduct is pure and upright. Like, how do we know if it's a good boy or a bad boy? Well, by a consistent watching of their behavior. We, like, and God's sovereign and omniscient. He's not, he's not trying to figure stuff out. And here at the end of the age, Jesus said, yeah, your behavior is actually the evidence of what was going on in your heart. And so there's never a disconnect between, but from our beliefs and our behavior. Never. Like, your behavior is the evidence of what you truly believe. And Jesus would say it a different way. What comes out of the, the mouth, the abundance of the, the, the heart comes forth from the mouth. So whatever is the highest level of content in your heart is what most frequently comes out of your mouth. And so we, we got we to gotta remarry the divorce between, between our beliefs and behavior. Some people think, well, it's all grace. It doesn't matter how I talk. It doesn't matter how I live. It doesn't matter what I do. Because it's all grace, blood of Jesus, I'm justified forever. Um, you're in trouble. Like if you believe that, if you believe that you can have some form of theology that doesn't address how you live, but you still feel that you're good with God, and yet you live completely antithetically to God, you're in trouble. By the way, I used to be that guy, so I could say that with authority. I believed that ask Jesus into your heart, just ask him into your heart. For me, it was in my denomination, it was ask him into your heart, get water baptized, and you're going to heaven, and you're good. And I literally used that for 10 years to live like the devil, and I felt so comforted at times. So I'm saying, wow, thank God I got saved, because man, if I didn't, I'd be in trouble by the way I'm living. It's just terrible theology. So speaking of those that are in trouble, let's finish with these last verses. So some are going to be marked for everlasting wonder, and some will be condemned unto eternal wrath. And I said it as strongly as the Bible does, eternal wrath. I need you to get both words, eternal, never ending, no escape hatch, no, okay, you're, it, you, you've done your time. No calendar, no clock, eternal. And the second word is wrath. The wrath of God. And I, I get it, it's unpopular, but it is not untrue. And please remember, when this moment hits the earth, grace has been exhaustively given and has been exhaustively refused. So ultimately, in eternity, everybody gets what they wanted while alive. So you want Jesus? Repent and believe the gospel. Receive him as the Lord of your life. You will have him forever. You want independence from God? You die that way, you'll have what you wanted forever and ever and ever. But it's not going to look like what you thought. So we've got to get back to the place or maybe even figure out how to get to a new place to communicate to a generation, like a full generation. If you're 
50 and older in here, you're somewhat comfortable with topics and being discussed like wrath and judgment and hell because that's just kind of the flavor that we grew up under. But I'm telling you, if you're 30, you know, maybe even 40 and younger, somebody starts talking about hell, and, and the instinct is, ah, oh, it's all hellfire and brimstone, damnation preacher. And it's almost a caricature, and you just blow it off. And I'm like, man, just please read your Bible. Because it's not some crazy preacher. But I, do, I would say this, we probably ought to work on how we communicate it a little bit better. I don't take delight in, and when I was a young preacher, oh yeah, I'd, I'd love to get up in the pulpit, Peter. I'd get up there and be like, I, I thought everybody was lost. I'd, I'd preach to the church and just preach for two hours until somebody, some deacon would get saved. I mean, it was just like, somebody's going to turn in this place. But we, we, So we, we don't need to be aggressively enthusiastic and heartless, but we do need to be clear. And so Jesus is going to paint a clear picture here. And I, verse 41 to me is the unimaginable realities of hell. He says, then he will say to those on his left, depart from me. Now, remember what he said to those on his right. Come on in. Those on the left, depart from me. And he calls them cursed or cursed. Depart from me, you cursed ones, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Guys, it doesn't get any more clear than that. Um, you have to have 10 years of seminary to make that say what it, something other than what it says. Jesus said at the end of the age, his message to the group on his left is going to be away from me forever. I don't know how you feel about that, but let me just ask you, isn't that how they lived and what they wanted? Independence and away from Jesus from truth and the gospel, the authority of God? So is it unjust of God to give people exactly what they craved? No. He's a just and he's a holy God. But he, he, he says, you're cursed. I mean, that's harsh. feels harsh. But I want you to remember Galatians 3.13. Galatians 3.13 reminds us that Jesus Christ himself became a curse so that that word curse would never be on us. So there he is I, for their whole life in some fashion. I became a curse for you. You don't have to be cursed. Come unto me. Repent and receive me. I've taken your curse. No, we don't want you to rule over us. We don't want you. We don't like your ways. We don't like your message. We don't like your people. We don't like your nonsense. I am a law. I am my own captain. I'm going to fly my plane. I'm going to drive, sail my ship. I'm going to do my own thing. I don't want it. And now at the end, Jesus says, you stayed under the curse your whole life and now you can't get out from under it. That's the reality. Like, by the way, we're all born under the curse. But it, it amazes me. And again, people, they object to this kind of teaching. But it's like, we're all born cursed because of the fall. So it's not primarily that God has cursed anybody. We've earned the curse, and by his grace, he brings out of the curse those that will believe him. I mean, so it's not like God's throwing something on us. We're, no, we're all under it. And the only way you get out from under it is that you trust that it was placed on him. He got under it. And so when you trust him, it comes off of you, and it's placed on his account. But if you're not, if you're here tonight, and you've never trusted Christ. That needs that needs to be what happens to you. Come out from under the curse. Jesus became a curse for you, and here these people didn't. So he said, "You're going to enter into the fullness of your curse, into eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels." That is heavy. You can read it about it in Revelation 20:10. It's the lake of fire. In the Bible, the eternal abode of the unbelieving is described as. Everlasting fire, unquenchable fire, shame and everlasting contempt. That's in the book of Daniel. Um, it's described by Jesus as a place where the worm does not die and the fire is never quenched. It's described as a place of torment, flame, everlasting destruction, a place of fire and brimstone. It's actually in the Bible. Where the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. That's Revelation 14. It's called a lake of fire and brimstone where the wicked are tormented day and night forever and ever. And here Jesus, right here in this, Jesus saying this punishment is, itself is everlasting. 
like an everlasting consciousness away from God in a place that is, it's almost paradoxical. It's utter darkness, yet a place of constant fire. It's a fire that doesn't give light. Guys, listen, I know that this is like a little bit much, but this is real. Like, I'm, I know people that that's where they're going to be forever. They're, they're died. They're in Hades right now. They're going to be in the, in the lake of fire. And you and I have the answer. And we know the one. And I'm just going to tell you, I, you know, personally, I'm, I'm celebrating the Supreme Court ruling that seems to have been leaked out. There's nothing in my heart that wants to see an abortion doctor enter into the lake of fire forever. There's nothing in me that wants to see them get their due. Why? Because if it wasn't for the grace of God, that's where I'd go. That's where I'd be. And I'll give you this last thing. Can y'all give me like three more minutes? The kids, they get on to me anyway. They say I always finish early on Wednesday nights. But if you need to go, just give me a few more minutes. If you need to go, you can. But notice what Jesus says then. This is, you're, you're going into eternity without me, prepared for the devil and his angels. Revelation 20.10, Satan ends up in the lake of fire. They're going to be in there with him. It's just, it's awful. And Jesus says, I was hungry, but you didn't give me any food. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, you did not welcome me. Naked, you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, you did not visit me. And notice, they're shocked too. Both groups are shocked. Not so much at where they're going, but why Jesus gives evidence, the evidence that he gives shocks them. And they said, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick and in prison and did not minister to you? Notice this. These people are not indicted for the flagrant, wicked, foul things that we think hell-deserving people do. Everything is a sin of omission. It's not what they did. It's what they didn't do. It's pretty powerful. So in this, in, in this very intense passage where Jesus is saying two groups are going to be marked for eternity, one group is like, you mean that's, you were looking for a life that was so touched by you that it made me love people and take care of them? And Jesus says, yeah, that's evidence. Come into my, come into my father's kingdom. And then the other people are, 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 again, that Matthew 7 crowd that may have preached, cast out demons, done many wonderful works. And Jesus said, but actually you didn't love people. You had no heart for people. And it's what you didn't do that is the evidence against you. So I, I read this stuff and I'm like, God help me, I need to love more. I'm not worried about my soul, but I am, I am concerned that like if Jesus is prioritizing this at the end of the age, I think it's a trumpet sound for all of us to up our game. And I don't mean that in a crass way, but like, what are you doing with your life? Like, could it be that we're doing all this stuff? And Jesus is like, that person's hungry. That person can't pay her light bill. That prisoner hasn't been visited in 15 years. And Jesus says, when somebody steps up, Jesus says, I receive what you just did as if you did it to me. That's the kind of Christianity that we've got to get reconnected with. And it doesn't mean the other stuff doesn't have its place. I'm just saying it, it doesn't have a, a good place if this stuff is being denied, ignored, or neglected. And so I guess we're done kind of. Um, I mean, it's just there's no way to, you can't put a bow on this. Um, So I'll, I'll close right here. James 2.18. James 2.18. Some say, I have faith, you have works. James said, show me your faith apart from your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. There is no such thing as a faith, a genuine faith, that remains perpetually fruitless. We're not saved by our works, but we cannot say that we're saved if there are no works. And so may God help us to grow. We're not there yet. We have a lot of room to grow. I've got a lot of room to grow in this area. In the midst of all the good stuff, prophecy, and power, and 
amazing altar calls, great deep worship and prayer meetings and, you know, sermons and crowded house and all of that stuff and, you know, house churches and a growing children's ministry and all this good stuff. It's all good. I don't want you to feel badly about it. But guys, can we, like, contend that God wouldn't allow our hands to be busy while our hearts are still? I'm feeling that right now. So let's stand to our feet. Just bow your heads. Just do that. So if, if you know right now in this room that you've accepted Jesus, I want you to exhale. I don't want you to lose what you've heard tonight, but I don't want you to get all knotted up. It's an invitation it's not a condemnation. It's an invitation. It's an invitation to just, hey, let's do the first work. First commandment and the first works. Let's love well. Let's repent of every shred of bitterness or potential bitterness. You have the power to uproot that thing right now. Just, it's a decision. It's a decision. It's not a feeling. It's almost never a feeling. That's why a lot of us wrestled with bitterness longer than we needed to, so we were waiting, on, we were waiting to feel non-bitter to declare that we had repented. You repent, and you'll become non-bitter. Let's do it.